Okay, tonight I'm going to start with anti-crisis. The Bible talks about there's many anti-crises in, in, the, in the world. Not the antichrist, not the one who's going to come in on the tribulation and proclaim to be God. That is the anti-crisis. The antichrist. But this, the Bible speaks about anti-crisis, the spirit of the antichrist. And of course, that leads to what we're teaching on. It leads to why we have cults. A lot of false teachers. <clears throat> In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time, as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. He, start, he starts off by saying little children. Now usually he says brethren. But right here says little children. So he's speaking to less mature, let me put it that way, to less mature Christians. That's why he says it's little children. Because mature Christians ought to know this by now. So that's why he says little children. So he, he's addressing those who are not as mature. When it says in the last time, he's talking about now. Because in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, God, who sundry times and in divine divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds so right here is just showing that the last times this is now this is he sent his son this is this is the last not, I'm not talking about like okay we're in the last time the Lord's coming while we're living I'm just talking about the last time what he's talking about is Jesus being here. Either physically, because the last time it started even when he was on earth. Even when he was here. But now he's speaking to, to us in the Holy Spirit. So first he spoke to us in his physical body. In the flesh, not in the flesh, but yeah. in human form. But now he speaks to us in the Spirit. So these last days he's talking about, he's talking about now he's speaking to us. First Peter one twenty, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you so this is the last times it's not talking about in the tribulation last times it's talking about now this is the last times what he's talking about. i just wanted to explain that right now the lord is speaking to us and right now he's talking about the antichrists the spirit of the antichrist he says even now there's many antichrists first john 4 3 and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Just like his enemies nailed him to the cross and killed him, that same Antichrist spirit is still here today. And you, you know, who put it on them people to say, crucify him, crucify him? That was, that was coming from demons. That was coming... Uh, I mean, Antichrist is that's, it's not like, it says the spirit of the Antichrist. What is the spirit of the Antichrist? The spirit of the Antichrist is wanting to be God. So anything that is of God right now, he wants to get rid of. Because he wants to be God. Alright? So, just like they put him on the cross and killed him, that's what we do today. Many people do that still today. They don't want to accept Jesus. So when you don't accept him, you kill him. You kill him by... Not putting them in your life. You understand? First John chapter 2 verses 22 and 23. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. He is, he is in the Christ that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledged the Son hath the Father also. Now this is a sure sign that... The belief of cults is they do not recognize Jesus Christ as the Son. And right here it says, He that denieth that Jesus is the Christ is the Antichrist. That denieth the Father and the Son. This is why the Jews are still lost. They didn't accept the Son. They haven't accepted Jesus Christ as the Son, as the Messiah. So people who don't believe in the Son... But believe in the Father, it don't go together. Because right here it says, Father and the Son. you got to have those two together to be a believer. And like I said, verse 23, I want to say it again. Whosoever denied the Son, what did the, what did the Jehovah Witness do? 
They don't accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God. They don't accept Him as being God. They say He was just a prophet, just a man, which He was a man, and He was a prophet, but He was God come in the flesh, and they did not accept that. Right here it says, Whosoever denied the Son. You might say that they believed in God. The religious leaders. You might, well, they believed in God, and yes, they did. They did believe in God. But if we look at Nicodemus, he was a religious leader. He was like a cardinal in today's religion. Like he was not the highest, but he was kind of in the middle. And John chapter 3, verse 1 through 3 says, There was a man of the Pharisees. That's why it says he was a, he was a religious leader. Named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus, an Jesus answered and said unto him. Now this is what Jesus said to this religious leader. And he was high in his religion. This is what Jesus said to this religious leader. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So he was telling Nicodemus, you need to be born again to see this. This religious leader. So... Unless you accept Jesus, you do not have the Father. These, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, they believed in God, but they didn't accept the Son. First John 4, 3. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Now, well, you know, really, seriously, what do people do with these verses? Second John, verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So whoever, whatever religion is out there who is denying that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, has come as God in the flesh, what does it say right here? He's an antichrist. False teachers masquerade as God's servants. That's what they do. They, sp they speak about... Religious stuff, they act like religious leaders, but just like the devil, just like the devil did, Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verse fourteen, it says, "And no mortal, for Satan himself is transformed into the angel of light." It is, it is that disguise that 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 transforms he's got, that disguise that he appears to be religious man. A man of God, he, he appears that way. And people accept him in the church. Because he's not going to come to the church with a, a pitchfork, horns on his head, and a ponytail. He's not going to come that way to the church. Because, you know, even we have common sense to know better than that. Even though that is not what the devil looks like. But he comes with a disguise. Right here he says he's transferred into an angel of light. He seems to be and acts to be a religious man. And people look at him that way. They look at him as being a godly man. Uh, churches were men, men that preach or in suits. Okay, well that that's nice, but what what impresses the people on them is not the robes because they're not wearing robes. But what impresses people on them is doctor, so and so, pastor, or the name and then Ph and all this. Uh, a man who has a several degrees, diplomas and. You know, that's what, they, that's what they're impressed with. Others are impressed with the way they look. Others are impressed with what, they, what kind of degrees they have. This is a disguise. Men of God don't need that. Men of God don't have to wear stuff to show they're men of God. Men of God don't have to go to college. Because we have the Holy Spirit that teaches us. But this is what the world wants. This is what the world looks at. In Luke chapter 22 verse 53. When I was daily with you in the temple... You stretch forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Jesus is telling these false religious leaders that their darkness of being a devil's servant is now here. It's been here and is here now. This is the hour of the power of darkness. Ephesians 6.12 It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Okay, remember, we're talking about Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, that's what we're talking about. So right here in Ephesians 6.12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, not against man, when that's not who we're wrestling against, but against principalities 
against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual weaknesses in high places. So again, we're not fighting against men who have a form of righteousness. That's not who we're fighting against. But against the devil who has control over them. Remember, if you're a born again Christian, there's no way you can be possessed by the devil. Because there's no way the devil and the Holy Spirit can live in the same place. And if you have the Holy Spirit in you, praise God. Praise God. You don't have to worry about a demon coming inside of you. Amen? Is that good to know? <laughs> yeah, I should have got some loud amens on that one, but that's okay. I got some small ones, but that's, all, that's all right. <laughs> so, uh, these men in high places, they're being run by the demons. It says it right here. The spiritual weakness in high places. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So these men that have power, these men that are rulers, that are in high places, like the churches, like even in political offices, they're blinded. They're blinded. And they're trying, they're trying to get it. The devil wants as many as he can to go to hell with them. Because the devil knows. Like I said, the devil knows the scripture already. And he knows where he's going. And he's fighting it. But if he's going to go, it's like, well, I'm going to take as many as I can with me. And that's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. And he's very successful at it. Look at Jim Jones and Charles Manson. They claim to be Christ. They claim to be Christ. Shirley MacLaine, she had a best-seller, best-selling autobiography, and she was convincing many of her readers in reincarnation. Now these these actors, they had a lot of people follow these actors. Whatever these these actors have power. People they look up to all these good actors, and and Shirley MacLaine, she was a very famous actress. And but she convinced her readers in reincarnation, and they believed her, just because she was a famous actress. And you got a lot of them like that. You got a lot of famous actors who say things, and people believe it because they said it. Galatians one eight. But though we, are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul is saying here, if if he or any of his followers, or angels from heaven, which means fallen angels, change any of God's words, says don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. That's why we need to know. That's why we need to study. That way we'll know if they're, uh, if they're coming to us with lies, trying to deceive us. Okay, Second John, verse 10 and 11. It says, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine... Receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. So this is not to let him in your house. I've said that many times before. If you get these Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, come knock on your door, don't let them in. It's right here, it says it. They have a different doctrine. Verse 11. He that abideth in God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So what he's showing here, if you let, if, if you let them in your house, what he's saying here, if you let them in your house, you're showing what they're doing is not so bad. Because you've let them in. And if you let them in, you've listened to them. For that, that is showing them that you support them. And right here it says not to do it. It says let him be a curse. Means leave them to God's judgment. Leave these people who do that to God's judgment. Alright, that's what it means. The Lord will take care of them. Praise God, we have, we have the word of God. The absolute truth. Nobody changes this Bible. We don't have men finding mistakes in this Bible. Proverbs 14.12 and 16.12 There is a way which seemeth right unto men, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is ways that seem to right. They seem to be right. You know, you get someone all dressed up with the white collar and they look religious. It seems they would be right. Or even a good person, a good moral person, not Christian person. You get a good moral person. That seems to be right. I hear is, but the end thereof, or the ways of death. It says, seemeth. There is a way which seemeth right. It didn't say that is right. It just seems to be right, but it's not right. Being religious and going to church seems to be right. Right? People look at that and they, oh, what a... They'll even call you a Christian. Oh, what a Christian. 
goes to church every Sunday. But you better read the Bible and make sure it's the righteousness of God. When you see someone that's religious, you better make sure that their righteousness is from the Lord. And they're not just have the righteousness of what we're talking about here. The spirit of Antichrist is in them because they do not have the true word of God. They are not following the true gospel. They're being led astray by whatever the religion they're in, whatever man they're under, uh, they're being led astray. Like Baptists, Pentecostals, Church of Christ. You know, these are churches of God, but we have, even in these churches, we have men in there that are not born again. Just because they have a past, they have the title of pastor, that doesn't mean they're right with God. That's why we have to have the discernment. We gotta, we we have to recognize a wolf from a true man of God. Some of these so-called Christians hear what what they have to say. The third, the third Mormon president said, "This is what the the third Mormon president said." This is a quote. That Christianity was hatched in hell, hatched in hell, and a perfect pack of nonsense. The devil could not invent a better engine to spread his work. So he's calling us Christians, because he said Christianity, yeah. we're spreading the devil's work. That's, that's a quote from a Mormon president. In an ad from the Los Angeles Times, now I don't know if I'm going to say this lady's name right or not, but I'm going to try. It's a foreign name, so. Shira Majada Maramala Diva. That's a long name, too. She's, it says that she's the most important spiritual figure in today's world. She is. She will, it says, she will awaken you in you the force that will change your life and change your world. The awakening ex explains and brings together all the great religions. It brings inner peace, health, and joy. It is the last evolutionary step promised by traditions that stretch back to the beginning of human spiritual awareness. And this is from a lady who belongs to the United Methodist Church. And this is a lady who is in the Methodist Church who is now, we believe, you know, we, we feel like Methodist churches are churches of God. All right? We, I mean, like I said, cults, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, and all these Oriental ones, we know those are cults. But this is the Methodist Church. And this lady right here, she's speaking about the Lord here. She's saying that she will, she will bring the force. It's like, like in Star Wars, the movie. Yeah. Uh, so let the force, said, let the force be with you. I mean, I mean, she's she's said this. I, I don't know if she's got it from Star Wars or not, but <laughs> that's what it's like. The force is what well, she's saying. The force is your good and positive side. That's what I mean. This is what she's saying. the force that is in you, and which the Lord, He's told us what's in us. The Lord has told us what's in us. In Genesis six five. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's what's in us until you get born again. But she's talking about this force of being good and positive. That's the what that's the kind of teachings we got going on. And right here she's very she's very she's very popular. But what I've said before Christians are not popular. Especially preachers. Now you got cults out there. You got people out there who are saying, we can be a god. Most cults look very good because they're very mortal, mortal, good people like the Mormons. You see their commercials on TV? They have some good commercials on TV. But if you ask a Mormon what they believe in hell, well, they'll tell you, well, you become a god. I mean, they don't have a hell. When you die, well, they do, and I'm going to show that a little further down. But to Mormons, it's a, they believe you can be a god. Okay, get off the hell part right now. They believe you can be a god. When Mormon, if you're a Mormon, you're a Mormon believer, when you die, you can have your own earth, and you're the god of that earth. That's what they believe. They have a book about the Mormons. It's called The God Makers, which I've told you that before. It teaches that men can become like God and have their own little world. That's what it teaches. And it's a good book to read. Like I, 
I've said many times I, I'm, I don't read books. The Bible's the only thing I read. But I have read two books. And that's the only two books I've, I've read since becoming a Christian. And that was The Godmakers and Seduction of Christianity. Those are the only two books I've ever read outside the Bible. And they are both were very good books. Bill Volkman has written books. And one of his books, he says, What does he want me to do? I say, what do I want to do? It's like, what does God want me to do is what he's saying. But he says, but I'm saying, what do I want to do? He's saying, what do I want to do? Why am I looking for what God wants me to do? What do I want to do? Luke 22, 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, my will, but thine be done. So whose will are we should be looking for? We should be looking for God's will, not our will. But this is what he's saying. We should be looking for our will. What do we want to do? But the scriptures say, hey, we need to look at what's God's will for us. Also in Matthew 6, 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We want God's will here on earth with us. We want his will. But this guy preaches something else. And you know what? People like that. Oh, what do I want to do? When you hear stuff like that, it's like, oh, I like this preacher. You know, and that's why they have a big following. He also has written in books that Jesus said. Now, he, in his book, he put down a quote. He put down, the scripture says in John 10, 34. He, this is in his book. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are God's. Then he says, so why did Jesus say that they were gods? Because all of us are gods. So because of what Jesus said there, he's saying we can become gods. Because God said, ye are gods, calling us gods. Small g gods, but calling us gods. So that's why he's saying we can become God. First, we need to see who's saying this. This is, it is written. When it says it is written, it's, it's taking you to the Old Testament. Whenever you read in the New Testament, it is written, it's telling you it was written in the Old Testament, okay? In Psalms, and this is where it was said, in Psalms 82, verses 1 through 8. God standeth, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods. Now, we'll see that these gods right here, this little G, God, now in the Bible, in the King James, letters are very important, and if it's got a small G, then we know it's not talking about our God, God Almighty. We're going to see that he's talking about judges here. Verse 2. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the person of the wicked, defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the, deliver the poor and the needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked? They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundation of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods. This is where he got it. That God in the congregation said, ye are gods. And all of your children, meaning the sons of the Most High. So when he says, and all your children of the Most High, he's talking about the sons. So there are judges and, and sons. Of God who do judging and it says but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the prince do true gods die if you're a God do they die does God die and right here it says but ye shall die like men see if even if this was God's even if it did mean that which it doesn't but even if it did it's not a very powerful God is it because it's right here our God says they will die like men so if I have a God that's gonna die like a man I don't want them. Right. Amen? Amen. And it says, fall like one of the princes. And who is that prince he's talking about? Ephesians 2.2. 2. Where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. So that prince that he's talking about, he's talking about the devil. This is the devil. Revelations 20.10. And the devil that deceiveth them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beasts and the false prophets are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's the devil 
that deceives. The devil, that, that's what, he's a master of, of deception. He, he's a master of it. And he's, a lot of people follow it. A lot of people are following it. And there's a church in Seattle, Washington. And the pastor's name is Casey Treat. And his church sits 3,500 people. And the building is getting too small. That's how many members he's got in his church. He says one of his favorite verses in the Bible is Genesis one twenty six. That's one of his favorite verses. And the ver- it says, Let us make man in our image. And the way his interpretation of that verse is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost had a conference, and they said, Let us make man exact, an exact duplicate of us. An exact duplicate of us. And he tells his con- congregation to repeat it out loud. I am an exact duplicate of God. This is what he tells his congregation to do. And the congregation gets louder and bolder every time they say it. And the people at the church start to believe it. But he says that verse means exact duplicate. That means we're just like God. Without sin. That's, a, that's an exact duplicate. If God is without sin then, and we're an exact duplicate, like he says, then we're, we're without sin also. And we know we're sinners. We all know we're sinners. Hmm? And then there was a man called, again, these names, I don't know where to get these names. Till Hard, Hard, something like that. Well, anyway, he's a French priest. He believes in evolution, science, spirits joining together. He's into the New Age movement. He also believes in humanity merging into God. We're merging into God. The New Age movement, they, they had... They believe that Christ, that Christ was separated from Jesus. That Jesus was not the Christ. They say, no, Christ was separated from Jesus. That's what they say. And also, they have no source of authority. If you belong to the New Age movement, there's no source of authority. You're, you're free. You have a free will to do what self wants to do. They also believe in reincarnation. They believe in self-rule. They, that's what they believe in. They say that only evil... If you have selfish, selfishness, that's the only evil that you have in you. They believe Jesus and Lucifer were brothers. <laughs> and, I mean, look it up. You know, it's the New Age movement. I mean, these, these people who believe this, I, mean, I don't even know what to call them. Really? I mean, the devil says they're blinded. But I'm going to show you later. Even people who are blinded can see God. And I'm going to show you later. Okay? Agnes Stanford. She's a great follower of this Till, Till Horde guy. And it says she's a large influence on Christianity today. And she is quoted and recommended widely by Christian leaders. And she's a, she's a believer of this guy. And it says she's very influenced in the Christian world today. Christian world. That's what I'm saying. Cultism is sneaking into the church. Yeah. It's sneaking into the church and we're allowing it. We're allowing it because we go to churches that the pastor is allowing it. If the pastor is allowing this, and what do we do? We follow the pastor. We don't read the Bible. Whatever he says, we think that's right. So if the pastor is allowing it, then we figure it's okay. Right. If you don't study after this teaching, then you just want to be an ignorant fool. That's all. That's all I can say. And really, seriously. After this teaching, if you don't become a studier of the Word of God, then you want to be an idiot. Sorry, but I just tell it like it is. Yeah. I, I, Isaiah 43.10 Talking about becoming gods, all these religions. <clears throat> Isaiah forty three ten, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am He. Before me there was no god formed, neither shall there be after me. Now, this is the word of God, so I guess they're not reading this. I guess they're not reading the Bible. Because if they read the Bible, then there's no way they can say, we become gods. Because God says it right here in his verse. Neither shall there be any God after me. Isaiah 44, 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it. Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Nay, yea, there is no God. I know not any. God is saying, I don't know of any other God. He said, is there a God besides me? He's saying, no. 
I don't know of any other God. God has shown over and over, I am the only God. There's none before me, and there's none after me. Isaiah 45, 5. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God besides me. Amen. Now, do we believe the Word of God? Yes. If we believe the Word of God, then we know those those religious men who are saying you can become gods they're nothing but liars and they got the spirit of the antichrist in them right i mean the devil's been doing he's been wanting this since the very beginning of time because in genesis chapter 3 verse 5 for god doeth know that in that day this is the devil talking to eve for god knoweth that in that day ye eat thereof then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods knowing good from evil so from, from all the way back in Genesis, the devil has been trying to, to teach us or show us, hey, you can be a God too. He did it with Eve. He told Eve, you can become a God. You'll know good from evil. All right. So all the way back in Genesis uh, till now and in the future, men are going to say, hey, you can be a God. And this is coming from the spirit of Antichrist. This is how these cults get started. Amen for these verses? Amen. We know. So if somebody says, hey, you can become a God. Uh, excuse me? Uh, I guess you didn't read Isaiah. Right? I mean, that's what we tell them. If you haven't read it, why don't you go read Isaiah 43, 44, 45. Read those three chapters. Everything but the Lord. That's what, that's what the Antichrist wants. He wants to teach everything but the Lord. And hyp uh, hypnosis? It's not Christian. It's not Christian. Psychiatrist? Mm -mm. Can a psychiatrist deal with your soul? No. He can mess with your head, but who can deal with the soul? If you got a problem, you want someone who can touch you here, not in your head, your soul. Because that's where you're going to get the help. And being God is the only one who can do that, that's where you want to go. Not to a psychiatrist. And what does he do? He wants to know about your past. Jesus says, repent. Turn from your past. You're a new creature now. He's not telling us to look back then or well, what did your, your daddy do or what did your stepfather do? You know, stuff like that. They don't want you. Psychiatrists want you to look back and so you, they can blame it on somebody why you are the way you are. But that's not the way God is. God never says look back. In fact, he says if you look back, how can you plow a straight line? Hmm? Positive, positive thinking. These are things that play with our mind. In some cases, the world calls it mind power. Robert Schuller, Robert Schuller is watched on TV, and it says they have, he has like three million people every Sunday that watch him. Three million, Robert Schuller. And he's being accepted by other preachers, by other Christian preachers, he's being accepted by what he says. Other Christian preachers, not other religious, it says he's being accepted by other preachers, Christian leaders. That's what I'm saying, it's sneaking into the church. Positive thinking, all this baloney I just said, is creeping into the church. Schuler, Robert Schuler writes, this is what he wrote, I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ and under the banner of Christianity that has proven more destructive to human personality and counterproductive to the, the evangelism enterprise than the often crude, awkward, unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their loss and sinful condition. He thinks this is absolutely terrible that we tell people they're sinners and they need God. This is what he says right here. We should not point out people's sins. That's all Jesus did in the New Testament. And right here, Shuler's saying, that's wrong. Because he's a positive thinking. Don't, don't put this negative thing in here. And Christianity is accepting this kind of preaching. Positive thinking. He doesn't want people to see the need of Jesus. That's bottom line. He don't want people to see that we need Jesus. Because who, people who see they need Jesus are, are people who what? Who are down. Who are lost. Who are going nowhere. That, that's, who, that's, that's where I was going. That's when I was saying I need the Lord. And I imagine most of us in here realize... I need the Lord because I'm heading nowhere. Mm -hmm. But he's against that kind of teaching. He has said that a person is in hell when he has lost his self-esteem. That's what he says. 
These are quoted by Robert Schuller. These are quotes by him. His preaching is success and self-esteem. That's what he preaches. Isaiah 26.3 Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Doesn't say on us. Positive thinking is you. You think positive for you. But right here it says, whose mind is stayed on thee, the Lord. Because he trusts in thee. So our mind is supposed to be on the Lord, not us. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than yourself. So if we're going to esteem somebody, esteem a brother, someone who needs to be lifted up, not ourselves. We don't need to be esteeming ourselves. Remember, when you give your life to the Lord, what do you do? You die to self, right? You die to self and you've given your life to the Lord, your heart to the Lord. So we see what he's teaching. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you. Not you exalt yourself, that God can exalt you. Amen? Amen. I'm glad we have the truth. I don't know how many times I'm going to say it, but that's, I mean, I'm, uh, seriously, I'm glad, I'm glad the Lord has shown us the truth. I'm glad we have His words. Mm-hmm. Hebrews 11, chapter 20, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 25. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses, he wouldn't make it in, in uh, Robert Schuller's church because he chose to suffer affliction. That's negative. That's not positive thinking. Right. Moses was saying, I'd rather suffer with my people than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. They don't, that's not positive thinking. Right. That's what being a Christian is. If being, prosecuted, if being a Christian means being prosecuted, I'm in. That's what he's saying. Robert Schuller ain't going to preach that. 2 Timothy 3.12 Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer prosecution. Is this positive thinking right here? No. They say those who live godly lives will be honored and successful in this world. Well, I guess uh, John the Baptist wasn't a Christian. Because uh, he, right here it says, they, they said those who live godly will be honored. Was John the Baptist honored? They be, he was beheaded. Was he successful? He lived in the wilderness. Do you hear me? Faith and positive thinking are not the same. Faith comes from God. Positive thinking comes from man, from yourself. So what do we want? We want what we want. Is that what we want? To satisfy self? Or are we going to put our faith in God who can satisfy us? So choose. Choose which one you want. You want positive thinking? Go join Robert Schuller's. Well, you don't even have to go all the way over there. You can go right here to uh, to Houston, to uh, Osteen's church. He teaches the same thing as Robert Schuller. Positive thinking. Is there a hell? Well, we got religions out there that, are, that say there is no hell. First John, chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. He that hath the Son hath life. And he hath not the Son of God, hath not life. These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can have eternal life. What is that? Eternal life is what? Hell? Mm, Eternal life is heaven. (laughs) But to get this, what do you got to do? You got to believe on the Son of God. Revelations 20.15 And whoever so and whosoever was not found written in the book of life and who's written in the book of life? Christians. Christians are in the book of life. Because God said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is the life. So if you have Jesus, you have life. So if you have life, you're in the book of life. Alright? And whoever so wasn't found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Is that hell? So why do they believe there's not a hell? Right here the plane it says, if you're not born again, if you don't have Jesus Christ, 
you're cast into the lake of fire. This is the word of God. What do they do with this verse? Mormons have three places to go when you die, like I said earlier. They have three places. Those who believe you are going to be just like God, if you die, if you die and you're a Mormon, then you're going to have your own world and you're going to be a God. That's one, that's one way. The other uh, place you go is for righteous people who are not Mormons. I'm talking about, I guess, good people. It says there's a planet, a planet, or even maybe here on earth, <clears throat> where they go. They don't go to hell, but there's a planet for non-Mormons who are good people. There's a place for them. And then number three, they, they said there's a planet, there's another planet where wicked people go. And they say, this was for, and this, well, at least they're right on this. This was prepared for Satan and the demons, but now wicked people are going there also. Now that is true. You know, the lake of fire, what, God didn't make the lake of fire for us. He made it for the devil and the demons. Mm -hmm. But since we acted and followed the devil, then we're going to follow him all the way, straight to hell. Seventh day at Venice, their founder was Helen White. The Bible explained to her in a vision. The Bible was explained to her in a vision, and she interpreted in her books, they believe in no hell. To people who seven day, they don't, Seventh Day Adventists, they don't believe in hell. There is no hell. There is no hell because Betty White, I mean, Ellen White, Betty White. <laughs> <laughs> Helen White oh. was the Bible, <laughs> the Bible was explained to her in a vision. At least that's what she said, okay? And she was shown there is no hell. And you know how many people believe that? I mean, Seventh-day Adventists, they're not a real big religion, but they're there. They're there. Church of Scientology and the New Age movement, they believe in reincarnation of the soul. There is no hell. You just come back either as a person or you come back as an animal. But there is no hell. You just keep recycling. That's what they believe. Church of Scientology and New Age movement, that's what they believe. The Unification Church believe everyone, everybody will go to heaven. Everybody's going to heaven. That's what they believe. There is no hell. I mean, what these people are following, these beliefs here by these religions here, they're following them because they don't know. They don't know nothing. They've never, they've probably never picked up the Bible and read it. Someone who's come to them and say, hey, and gave their belief to them, Remember, we're all, almost all people, are looking for something to have faith in. And when these people here reach them before we do, well, they're going to follow them. If God was looking for a perfect man to teach us, to preach to us, He'd have to come down here again. Huh? Yeah. That's true. But everybody knows, everybody knows that there is a God. Everybody knows that. John 1, 9, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So the Lord right here is saying that He was the true light, Jesus, which lighteth every man. Every man. Now right here, man means people, not just men. It says, He is the true light, Jesus, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So everyone will know about Jesus. Everyone. Right here, the, it's, the, it's the Scripture. Which lighteth every man. So no man can go before the Lord and say, I didn't know. Romans 1, verses 18 through 23, and then 32. Verse 18, but God shows his anger. I'm going to read out of the Living Bible. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their weaknesses. Weaknesses. They know the truth about God. They know the truth about God. Because he has made it obvious to them. Amen? Amen? I mean, right here, I mean, I'm telling you, there will be nobody who will be able to go before the Lord and say, I didn't know. It's in, in, it's in the scriptures. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. God will, will, God will show disapproval, disapproval to everyone if they did not accept Him. 
Because like I said, they will not have no excuse. They will not have, they cannot say, I didn't know. Because of these verses I just gave you. Just like he did with the flood, and like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, he's going to show people who are lost, people who don't accept him, they're going to pay. They're going to pay. And that, 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 just like the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah, that time is going to come again. And it's called the rapture. He's going to take his people out, and then he's going to bring judgment. Our physical senses, our physical senses, to some extent, shows that there is a God. I mean, it's like common sense. Common sense should tell you that there is a God. I mean, these bodies. Who can create, who can create these bodies? Huh? Verse 21. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideals of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Because what I said, what I explained in verse 20, here he says, they knew him. They knew him. Speaking about lost people, it says right here, they knew him, but they didn't accept him. Instead of doing what he says right here, instead of doing uh, praising him and stuff, instead of doing that, Psalms 29, 1, 1 and 2, instead of coming up with uh, these ridiculous ideals, it says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. We should give God all glory. All glory. Verse 2, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Amen. That's what we should be doing. Not thinking of ideals to make our own way uh, to heaven or, or to make things right because we want to do them. Oh, this is okay because whatever. That's what men are doing. Instead, what we should be doing is praising them and worshiping them. We were in church Sunday. They're passing the plate. And we've seen this song. We've seen, we've seen this song uh, before. Boy, that's a, I love this song. I think maybe we sing it in here. But, uh, man, that's a song. There is no way I can sit down. And I, I just totally, I, we had just, I just completely cut everybody out. I had my eyes closed, and I was praising the Lord. I mean, I was almost dancing. I was, oh, I mean, I was, it was a beautiful praise song to the Lord. Now, I don't know who else stood up. And, uh, Paula, who sits in the back, she said if she stood up and maybe a few more people stood up. But how can you not stand up when you're singing a song like that? Yeah. A praise song. Not just a song. I mean, this song was, was a praise song. They didn't glorify him or even thankful for what he's done. They used their vain imagination, their foolishness, it says, to come up with different ideals of giving themselves the glory, is what it says. They wouldn't accept the light of the Lord that he wanted to give them. They wouldn't accept it. And in verse 22, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. The Lord didn't say they were born fools. He didn't say they were born fools. He said they became fools. Because they didn't want to do it God's way. They didn't want to follow the Lord. And they didn't want to do it His way. And the Lord says that they became utter fools. The Lord gave us common sense to understand. But we choose to be fools. People choose to be fools. Now if this teaching seems to be hard. Well somebody has to say it. The Word of God says it. And I'm just preaching the Word of God, okay? Yeah. I'm just teaching the Word of God. That's all I'm doing. And I'm not going to apologize for it either. I don't ever apologize for what God says. If He says it, it's just and it's right. Amen? Now, how did we become fools? The next verse, verse 23. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So instead of worshiping God only, and He is the only one we should be bound down to, we know that, they worship statues that look like either people or animals. We have that all over today. That's how they became, this is how we become fools, by worshiping statues. I mean, it says it right here. It says it right here. I'm just reading the Word of God. It says it right here. You want to know, you want to know how to become a fool? Do this. That's how we become fools. We worship statues instead of the living God. 
in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, it says, and it just says in verse 7, you don't have it written down, I'm just going to tell you what it says. <clears throat> they said, uh, the, the king said, at the, at the sound of the musical instruments, that all the people, no matter what, what, what race, nationality, what language, didn't matter what language, they had to bow down and worship this golden statue that the, that the king Nebuchadnezzar, that he made, he had set up. So every time they heard the music, these musical instruments, they had to bow down and worship this, this calf, this golden statue. I don't know if it was a calf. I don't know. It says golden statue. And then down in verse 12, it says, But there were some Jews, and these Jews were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we've probably heard them names before. It says in verse 12, Whom you have put in charge of the providence of Babylonian, they pay no attention to you. Talking about these three are not paying attention to, to the music and that they're not bound down. Your majesty, they refuse to serve your gods, small g, and do not worship the golden statue you have set up. Now, they went and told the king, these three men, this is what they're doing. Now, I, I'm going to read the whole thing because we need to read the whole thing. In verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the golden statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. <laughs> Amen. 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 <laughs> I love that. That's, I, that's why I'm reading the whole thing because I love this. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. Even if, even if we get killed, is what they're saying. Even if God doesn't save us and we have to go through this and get killed, we're still not going to worship. <laughs> Amen? Amen? That's the way Christians should be. Yeah. We don't have very many of those, though. Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, trousers, robes, and other garments. And because the king, in his anger, had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego securely tied, fell into the roaming, roaring flames. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around <laughs> walking around in the fire unharmed. What kind of God do we have? Very good one. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, if he did this in the Old Testament, does he not do that today? My God changes not. That's what Malachi says. It says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he did it this back then, he can do this now. God can do whatever he wants. And the fourth looks like a God, is what they said. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors cried crowd around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their head was singed, and their corona was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. 
When the Lord does something, He does it right. <laughs> then Nebuchadnezzar said, Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent His angels to rescue His servants whom trusted in Him. They defiled the king's command and were willing to die rather to serve or worship any god except their own god. Amen. Amen. I love this story. And this is a true story. Yeah. Like this is that. not a true story that's not true. This is a true story. I like to see the four of them and the four of God. <laughs> I mean, like I said, when God doesn't, He doesn't. Did they come out smelling like? They didn't even come out smelling like smoke. Yeah. <laughs> Not even the clothes on their body burnt. We bow to no statue. Do you hear me? Yeah. That's what. That's what I'm showing here, Christians. We bow to. If you're a Christian, we bow to no statue. And and if you don't, like right here, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Might get saved because of that. It happened right here. This king got saved because of that. So when we, if we don't bow to these statues and everybody else is, but but we don't, somebody could get saved. Amen? Amen. Believe the word of God. Believe the word of God. Then in, down in verse 32, they know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage, encourage others to do them also. Again, these, men's, these men know they're doing. They know what they're doing. And just like I said about the pyramid, that all the laymen are down here, but the one on top, the founder, they know what they're doing, but they hide it. They hide it from us, from the ones at the bottom. So the people follow them, and they die, just like the leader dies. They go to hell. The leader's going to hell, and they're going to follow right behind them because they believed in him instead of the word of God. In Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, Jesus is talking to his, his disciples and he tells them in verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. He's saying when he comes he, for his people, it's going to be quick. That's what he's saying. And we know that it is. But he's saying, will he find people who are putting their faith in his words the Bible. Are they putting their faith in the Bible? And the only way you can put your faith in the Bible is by reading the Bible. So the Lord saying, right, shall he find faith on the earth? Is he going to find people who put their faith in this, who studied this and believed in the word of God? Or did they put their faith in a man? That's what it's saying right here. You have people who fall in this trap with the traditions of men. And they won't let them go. These traditions... These traditions have a grip on these people because that's the way they were taught. That's the way they were brought up. It takes the power of God, the Holy Spirit, to break them from those traditions of men. And if you don't allow the, the Lord to do that, you're in a trap and you're heading to destruction. You're heading to destruction. How many people, don't raise your hands and don't say nothing, but how many people do you know study their Bible like they eat food every day? If you don't eat every day, you're weak. You're going to be weak. It's known. It's a fact. Same thing with Christianity, being spiritual. You do not study the Word of God, you're going to be weak, and any man will be able to come and overpower you. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Study. The very first verse. Show yourself. Study to show yourself approved. That's what God is saying. Study. It's so important that we study, and that's one of the least things Christians do. How many people know about this Bible study? I know I, I've told Buku, and I'm, I'm sure y'all have told people, who's here? Nobody's hungry. Nobody wants to study to show themselves approved. And that is why, that is why, it says in Matthew seven fourteen, because because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. There's going to be very few people who find their way to heaven. They'd rather follow man in whatever they teach. If they say, hey, there's no hell, oh, they believe it. Everybody's going to heaven. They believe it. America is the last Christian-believing country in the world. And guess what? We're dying real quick. We're dying real quick. Now, in closing, the last verse. The reason... 
this teaching was given is so we can do what it says in Titus 1 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainslayer. Gainslayer or lost people or wolves or wicked men who are dressed in sheep's clothing who are preaching because of the money, gain slayers, they, whatever they can get out of it. The Lord right here says, hold fast what you've been taught, the Word of God. He said, hold fast onto that. He said, this is sound doctrine. This is sound doctrine. He says, do that so you can exhort and convince the, anti, the spirits of the Antichrist are just lost people, wolves. So this is what this teaching is for. So we can do this. Titus 1 9. Remember Titus 1 9. And obey it. And the way we're going to obey it is by not only through this teaching, but study. Study to show thyself approved.